Uh, please, everyone, be seated. So, uh, my name's John Iredell. Uh, I'm clinical, Dean of Clinical Medicine here, and it's my uh, privilege and pleasure uh, to uh, introduce this inaugural lecture. Uh, the first thing that's appropriate to do is to welcome everybody, um, welcome the audience in general. I'm delighted to say that once again the inaugural has proven very popular with uh, high school students, and we have represented, it's a very long list, we have representations today from Armadale Academy, Bathgate Academy, Beeslack Community High School, Borough Muir, Dalkeith High School, Fir Hill High School, Linlithgow Academy, North Berwick High School, Portobello High School, uh, St Kentigan's Academy, St Thomas of Aquinas High School, the James Young High School, the Royal High School, Trinity Academy and Tyne Castle High School. So uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, additionally, I know that uh, Professor Lean Clifford wanted to uh, recognise the distance travelled by many members of his family and his friends to be here uh, to support him this evening and to listen to his inaugural lecture. His daughter Ailsa, I think, wins the prize... I suspect travelling on Professor Lean's air miles, she's come all the way uh, from Princeton, uh, where she's on a one-year uh, study exchange from Oxford University, and his wife, uh, Dale, is here, and his son, Pierre. So welcome to you all. Um, his brother, Edward Lean, who uh, works at Imperial College, unfortunately couldn't be here, but Clifford informs me that this is just some form of family revenge because he couldn't make it to Edward's inaugural either. <laughs> Uh, Clifford's asked for a very special mention to be made to Ray Brettel, um, who many colleagues from the NHS and the university will remember was uh, a reader here and was instrumental in delivering care at the onset of the AIDS epidemic, ab about which I'm sure we'll hear some later on. Uh, and uh, Dr Brettel was uh, pivotal in recruiting and appointing uh, Clifford to his position uh, in Edinburgh University in 1989. Uh, so a little bit about the man. Um, uh, Clifford graduated from Edinburgh in 1978. Uh, he was born in Mauritius and had a distinguished career here as an undergraduate. His initial training was done at a hospital which a few of us in the audience, and I can just remember, called the City Hospital, which was a, a series of wartime huts, well, it actually was pre-war huts, out beyond uh, Morningside with a, a spectacular view of the Pentlands, I remember, from Professor Flenley's office. Um, he then did uh, junior hospital jobs at the City, uh, became a, a registrar in infectious disease, which uh, became his interest, the driving force behind not only his clinical interest, but also his research interest. He did further jobs in Manchester, and as I say, eventually in 1989, was appointed back here in Edinburgh as a consultant with an interest in HIV and a part-time senior lecturer. Um, he was appointed to a personal chair at Transpires in 2009, so this has been long in gestation, but I'm sure the quality uh, will be worth uh, the wait. He served with distinction uh, for both his specialty and for the NHS as a CSO expert uh, on the group and AIDS. He's uh, held several important roles for the British HIV Association, including uh, treasurer and other officers, um, and he's been on the MRC College of Experts. He's published extensively, and the 2009 date gives us quite a good benchmark of that. He's published no fewer than 40 papers since 2009, uh, which is an extraordinary achievement, largely, obviously, on blood-borne viruses, uh, HIV and hepatitis B and C. So, Professor Lee, it's my privilege and pleasure to ask you to give uh, your lecture on progress in antiviral treatment. And I have one other thing written down, which is unmute the mic. Thank you. you okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, John, uh, fellow professors, colleagues, friends, family, and school children. It's a really great pleasure to be here. A bit daunting, mind you. But anyway, what I want to do is uh, to, to give a brief uh, overview about what HIV and AIDS is all about for those young ones in the audience who don't remember much about this. Talk about some of the clinical trials that we've done, probably a couple of slides from there. Talk about the cohort studies looking at HIV and how patients respond to their treatment. And hopefully ending up with some of the exciting progress that we are seeing nowadays for the treatment of hepatitis C infection. So it's quite a lot of things to run through. This is a, a paper uh, in the Mortality Morbidity Weekly report in the US, 
describing a small group of, of homosexual men who were diagnosed with pneumocystis carrying out pneumonia. At the same time, they noticed that they had candidiasis and CMV infection. And soon, uh, by next year, in 1982, the similar thing was described among hemophiliacs. Very quickly, because of the fact that the patients were having cellular immune deficiencies and coming up with lots of opportunistic infections and cancers like Kaposi sarcoma, it was called AIDS. At that time, in the early days, not sure what was causing it. Lots of theories abound. Drugs, promis uh, promiscuity. So, so, so it killed about 40% of, of, of all its uh, victims and your median survival was about 18 months. So it was a death sentence. In 1983, the French workers, Luc Montagny and, ba and Françoise barré sinissy in Paris, they discovered this virus by looking at lymph nodes of patients inf inflected with this condition. And that was called LAV, standing for Lymphadenopathy Associated Virus. Later changed its name to HTLV3, and now we call it HIV-1. And that was pivotal in the sense that you know what was causing the condition. You could therefore look for targets and drugs that you can fight the virus with. That was very important. Those two later on won the uh, Nobel Prize. So we we'll go back to 1986. I was, uh, just came from Edinburgh, finished my research, went to my in fact, this unit in Manchester, my boss went on holiday watching the cricket and says, sort it out. So this patient uh, had these lesions on the, on, in the roof of the mouth and on the skin. And this is a cancer called Kaposi sarcoma. And it is caused now, we know, by HHV8 virus. And surprisingly, my recollection was that this patient was given zidovudine on a named patient basis even though it was in early 1986. And what happens is you can have CMV infection of the eye, causing blindness. You could have fits or paralysis, which uh, was caused by brain abscesses, or pneumonia, which is a very common presentation, or severe wasting disease. These are some of the manifestations of HIV and AIDS at that time. Now, this is a slightly more complex slide. In purple is the viral load, the amount of virus there is of HIV in a patient. And you can see following acute infection, it goes high up, settles down, stable, but rises gradually over time. At the same time, in blue, the CD4 cells, which are cells that we use to fight off infection, starts to, to decline. And once it drops below a certain level, about 300 to 200, patients start having symptoms of disease. And without any treatment, the CD4 count is depleted further. And without treatment, the patient is going to die. And that was the case in those days. So in 1987, there was a study in the US using AZT, Zadovidine, versus placebo. And within about 16 weeks of being on the, on the treatment or on the placebo, the, they had to stop the study because the results were so amazing. So 19 patients taking placebo had died, while one, only one on AZT. So that was quite amazing. So was, for the first time in 1986, 87, we're having a tool that can be used to prolong, albeit shortly, the life of the patient. That was the first treatment that we have. So it, it has a, a, a life of its own. So I was in Manchester at the time, and, and Ray Brettel is the gentleman at, at the bottom there. He then advised me to get some more intensive experience on HIV and said, Clifford, if you want to do ID in HIV, you will need to go to London. Although Manchester was quite big, with five million people there, and lots of HIV there, he said to me, go there. 
So there was two choices, either going to Chelsea Westminster with Brian Gazard, or going to St Mary's uh, Paddington with this other person there, that's Tony Pinchin. So I went to Tony, to, to Tony St Mary's, had a very good time looking after patients very sick, doing bronchoscopies on the ward. And then at the time, in Edinburgh, it, Edinburgh was the eighth capital of Europe because of the outbreak epidemic of HIV among intravenous drug users. And the concern at the time was this infection may spread into the heterosexual community. So, and London said, Clifford, there's a drop in St. Mary's, come and apply. But we said, Clifford, there's one in Edinburgh, <laughs> come and apply as well. So it was a difficult choice, but nonetheless, I, I opted to come to Edinburgh. And that was the start of an incredible journey of my career uh, in, in terms of moving to Edinburgh. So for those who go and watch movies, this is a, a, a picture from the Dallas Bars Club where, where this, sorry, where this uh, gentleman, Ron Woodruff, acted by Matthew McConaughey, he was diagnosed with HIV and he was given a few, a few months to live. And he went to look for drugs outside the medical community, going to buy peptide tea from some doctor in Mexico, and here going to, to Japan buying interferon. Unfortunately, Ron Woodruff died in 1982 with that, but nonetheless had a longer uh, survival than, than was given by his doctors. So the environment at the time, going back now to 1980, the late 1980s, was that the patient, this HIV was causing major devastation to the patients, physical and psychological. There was a lot of stigma and fear, both with the patients and also public and some healthcare workers as well. And the patients were very isolated and very frightened and felt very helpless. And what we were, we, luckily enough, we had a, a very caring, caring team, doctors, nurses, and the paramedics working with us. And what, ha be, what happened was that we became friends with the patients. We became their staunch advocates in terms of fighting for, for them and fighting for funding for, medic for their medications. And when we did not, survive, we did not, did not succeed and patients died, we attended funerals as well. And it was quite a major time in the sense that it's not what the doctor felt the patient needed, but the bottom line is the patient was boss and we were there to help the patient. And it's a major shift in terms of how we were practicing medicine way back then. So patient-centered plan. And for me, at the time, and for my colleague, Dr. Bethel as well, our, our job was to find medication that is safe and effective to try and prolong life, to try and find a cure for those patients. So we were starting with just a drug which prolonged life just for a short time, initially. So within about a few years of us using AZT monotherapy, single drug, we, were find, we found that there was evidence of resistance coming up very quickly, and therefore the drug was using, losing its usefulness. And this is, this is a paper published in 1997, which is seminal because very soon, as we understood that resistance were coming up, we went back to the roots of ID and look at TB management. So remember in Edinburgh, uh, Crofton, Surgeon Crofton, did the biggest uh, TB studies using combination therapy. So this paper looked at using three drugs two nucleosides and indinavir versus two nucleosides, and you can see that progression to atal death or mortality was half. And that was quite a very important milestone. And because of, of that study, it was the, an end to clinical endpoints whereby we were looking at progression, clinical progression. How many people died? How many people had progressed to severe advanced AIDS disease? So we started looking at what we call surrogate markers, which is measuring HIV viral load, CD4 cell count, 
And then later on, we could look at what mutations that were there, if any, so that we can plan the next regimen of drugs for the patients, looking at how terrible they are, each the combination, and also looking at how safe it is in terms of changes of liver, amylase, and other things as well. So that was a major shift. And patients were on the streets fighting against using clinical endpoints because death was not something we should be measuring in clinical trials. And this is what happened way back in 1997. All those lines are conditions which are causing <coughs> death in American population. And if you look at this line, this is HIV. 82, a peak down in the mid-90s, and as we started to learn how to use the drugs, using three drugs, and the advent of a class of drug called protease inhibitors, mortality fell quite sharply. So we were, for the first time, winning in terms of our fight against HIV. Less deaths. So where, where, what, what sort of things have, 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 have we been doing in, in Edinburgh? I, I put here a little that organogram. Here, the, the, the unit of us at the, at the Western General Hospital doing clinical trials. While we had lots of good collaboration with Andy Lee Brown, who is in Uganda, can't be here today, he was very, very forward thinking. He was thinking about looking at doing resistance testing in the, in, in the clinic, clinic with us. Peter Simmons with some immunological work in CD4, CD8 infection. Jean Bell and James Arnside. We were also, uh, we had done clinical trials against, uh, against Costum difficile, infection, MRIC and antifungal with fluconazole. And we did lots of MRC studies, too many to mention. But for today, what I would like to do is talk about our work with HIV and hepatitis C some of the cohort studies with UK Schick and, and DAD, and one, probably the best HIV study that MRC has done, which is the ESPRI study. Okay, this is probably the most complex slide there is, but I'll, I'll walk that through with you. Now, this is the virus, and this is the CD4 cell that, 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 is, uh, that is there. The virus needs to dock with the CD4 receptor, that's the first one, and there is an attachment. And there's a current, there's a drug now which is, it will, people are looking at that will stop this <coughs> attachment. That's one target, one agent. It needs a co-receptor, either CCR5 or CXCR4. And there is a target which blocks that, that binding as well. It's Maravrock. That's the second target. The third target, before the, before the virus enters the cell, is a fusion. So the virus has to inject the, nucleus, the, the nucleic acid into the cell. And there is a drug called amphibotite which blocks this fusion. So already you have three ta targets which will stop the virus getting to the cell. The virus needs to get to the cell to use the host genome to multiply. So that once the, 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 the RNA of the virus is in, in, is in the, the cytoplasm, there is a step called reverse transcription, and there is an enzyme, which is reverse transcriptase, which can be blocked by nucleoside analogs or non-nucleoside analogs. And that is AZT is in there, that's adobidin is in here. And then the next step is integration of the DNA into the host DNA. And we've got at least three agents that can block this step as well. And then there's budding of the virus, and then protease inhibitors, indinivir is the drug which was so amazing there, uh, to, which blocks the cuts the protein and allows the virus to mature. That's another target as well. So we've got about six targets here just now, and we're using them. Now, this is 2014. <coughs> And these are the drugs that, that have been tested. And you can see from about 27, 28 there, those in blue, which are the ones we currently still use, only 14 we're using. The rest either haven't been licensed because they're less efficacious than the current medication or because they're too toxic. And the one in black are the drugs that people are still testing in terms of trying to find 
a, a, a place for them in, in our fight against HIV. <coughs> These are the trials that we've done in the unit. So there are about, I counted this morning, at least sort of 16 drugs that we've tested in the unit. And here we've got five drugs against hepatitis C that we've tested. I won't bore you with all the studies, but you can see those, this lot never made it. Okay? Because either they were, they, were not, uh, they were either too toxic or not effective enough. So this is a sample of a depiction of the results of a study that we would have done. So there is regimen A, uh, uh, regimen a or B, and this is the number of people having an undetectable viral load, suppressing the virus from hundreds of thousands to less than 50, what we call undetectable. And you can see there is nothing to choose between those. So, so we were doing what we call non-inferiority studies, because to do superiority studies, we needed huge numbers of, of patients for doing these things. So this is an example. And then the other slide that, 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 is, that is shown usually is the rise in the CD4 cells, which, which it does go, uh, and, 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 and we'll compare the two regimens usually. So the, so the virus goes down, and the CD4 count goes up, and hopefully keeps going up until it becomes normal. <coughs> now, this is, this is a slide which I, I, I got from uh, David Cameron when he gave his inaugural lecture, I think, a, a year or so ago. And I, I like that because people, uh, because, it, it, the, because those two studies showed that being in a hospital or being in a unit doing clinical trials, you're more likely to have a better outcome than if you did not go to center, which were doing that. And the other benefit, I think, is very important, we should not underestimate, is that the hospital does benefit as well. Not only are there better outcomes for the patient, we also have uh, medication which is uh, given to patients much earlier, saving more lives, and also we, they are free. And then the tests sometimes that we are using in clinical trials are being used there before they are uh, uh, being used clinically on a day-to-day -day basis. So that is sort of translating the clinical research from clinical trials right into the clinic on a day-to-day -day basis. <coughs> now, each bar is the result of the percentage of patients with an undetectable viral load at 48 weeks from a lot of clinical trials. And you can see how we've done over the years. <coughs> this is an old study whereby only 60% of patients were being suppressed fully to less than 50. Whereas this study here, which was done about a couple of years ago, it's 90% of patients are fully suppressed. So we're getting a 50% improvement in outcome already as the, clinical, as the medication that we're using <coughs> are more tolerable and more potent and easier to take. For treating HIV patients, the British HIV Association recommends that we should use a, a, a minimum CD4 count of 350 cells for those who are asymptomatic. And they also you recommend using three drugs, two nucleosides, and one of the others. So this is what we, we, we do. And in terms of improvement in just the medication as well, way back in, in, in 1996, patients were taking about 30 pills a day in three or four divided doses. Ten years down the line, we've got three pills in one. So one pill taken once a day. Patients love it. They don't have to take the pills and rattle with their friends. They can just quietly <coughs> just swallow the medication. We've got two others, what we call single tablet regimen. So a, a, a whole combination in one pill. However, HIV therapy is not without complications. So we've got increased risk of dyslipidemia and cardiovascular disease. We've got resistance because, because adherence is very difficult. We've got lots of pills to take. Hepatotoxicity, lipodystrophy, which is very, very upsetting because it's a disclosure issue. You've lost a lot of fat around your, 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 your cheeks, or you've got very fat belly with a buffalo heart. Disclosure of HIV. A lot of patients haven't told the family that. Resistance is major, and obviously, 
lot of medication causes diarrhea and vomiting. So, however, if you were to stop HIV therapy, virus rebounds very quickly. And then the CD4 count stops going down again. So you need to take therapy lifelong, or else this whole thing happens again. So the, the MRC with the US set up this huge study of 6,000 patients comparing staying with your current medication or try and stop HIV therapy until your CD4 count drops just around the 250 mark and then restart it again. So that was called the drug conservation. That is, can you make the drugs last longer? You are not going to be exposed to the toxicity of the medication as well. So the potential advantages. So we were part of that group. And this is from the Lancet of New England Drug Medicine. In red, it's a bit small, those people who stop, who, who stop the medication. And you can see they have twice as much overall death and other complications like cardiovascular, kidney, or liver disease. So stopping therapy wasn't good for you. It had events happening. And the clever bots in the US look at inflammatory markers at the time of stopping or at the baseline. And, and these are all the high sensitivity CRP, IL-6 and day dimers were all associated strongly with, a, with death. And more importantly, the higher the viral load, the higher those markers and the higher the risk of death. So the conclusion was that once you start HIV therapy, it, and, and you should maintain suppression, irrespective of what the CD4 cell count is. So we're not talking about lifelong therapy, unless, of course, a cure is possible. And inflammation is bad for you. So I'm not going to talk about some of the cohort studies that we've done with, with this huge <coughs> conglomeration of, 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 of units, of the biggest units in, of looking after HIV in the UK. Initially, there were only eight from, from London, and then it was Edinburgh and Brighton. And, and by, by now, this group of hospitals are looking after more than half of all their HIV patients in the UK. So we've got about 47,000 patients to look at in terms of what is the, the, the changes of, in, over time in terms of progression of the disease, response and uptake of HIV therapy, and also what is it about some of the, what factors which are associated with virological and immunological response to therapy. So I said to you before, treatment is starting with CD4 count of 350. But people have challenged this thing and said, you should we not be treating patients at higher CD4 cell count, particularly if inflammation is driving some of the problems that we see. <coughs> the other thing which is happening at the same time, not just in the UK, but around the world, is using HIV therapy as pre preventing transmission of infection from the index case to the partners. So treatment is prevention. And obviously those people could have very high CD4 cell count. They don't need it for themselves, but they want to take it to prevent transmission to their partners. So what we did was, looking at the rate of CD4 decline and also clinical progression for those with high CD4 cells. And this is percentage reaching to less than 350 over time, and by about eight years, almost 90% of the patients have reached that endpoint. So progression from, from a high CD4 cell count to less than 350 occurred at around two and a half years, usually. However, if your viral load is very high, it can be faster. It can be 4.7 years. And if you low viral load, it can be lower as, as 0.7 years. And that was an important study because it allowed the, the design of this stu big study, which is happening now, treating patients with very high CD4 cells. We wanted to know numbers and want to know the time scale in terms of follow-up for those, for those patients. So that's been very useful to allow the START trial to take place. What about progression of HIV disease? If you look at those who are more than 
CD4 can have more than 650 versus those just between 500 and 650, there is a 55% increased risk of AIDS or death if they're not on treatment compared to, to those that have, that have CD4 cell count. So events are happening in this group even though they've got good CD4 cell count. The other question that we were asking ourselves is, will we have enough medication for our patients for the rest of their lives? So if we go back now to 2007, we had four classes of drugs and about 20 agents, some of which were too toxic to be used. And the question was, what about resistance to three classes of drugs that were there? So that was, that was studied with date and published in the Lancet. And by 10 years after starting therapy, about 9% of patients would have failed three classes and had resistance and were having detectable HIV virus. So unless, of course, new drugs, new combinations were possible, they are going to start dropping the CD4 cell count and starting the whole cascade of immune deterioration again. We did a civil, uh, repeated the study again in 2007, and we were very pleased to know that overall, this group of doctors were able to improve the suppression of the HIV. So in 2007, 83% were fully suppressed versus only 62% seven years earlier. There were more patients who were exposed to triple class, and those who had failed was 3.9%. But half of those we were still able to suppress further with new combinations. So we're not doing too badly. If it's, if it's going to be a problem, it's going to be a problem for only for less than 2% of the patient population that we have. So that's, that's good news. And indeed, we, by, by, by 2009, we have had about six, six new drugs, and we've had two drugs of a different class, and that's important, <coughs> because while you have resistance, it's cross-resistance within the same class, you can use a new class, and will, will, it's likely to be effective. So we have active, active therapy, and if effective therapy will be available. We then looked at life expectancy, and it's important, because way back in 1980, Ron Woodworth was given the 30 days to live, and most patients were going to die. And, and the perception when you have, say, new patient is, I'm going to die today. So we needed to have data to sub, which can be substantiated from our cohort in order to advise them <coughs> about planning. Should they stop therapy now or later? Should they start thinking of buying into a pension, starting a family, or even buying a house? And for, for the service providers, like the, the trust and, and the government, we needed to know how many people are living and how much will it cost in the long term. So the first study we did was published in the BMJ in 2011, and we looked at the survival of patients, and we had our statisticians in, in, in the group, which allowed us to extrapolate things, compared to the normal population. population. If you had been diagnosed with a count of less than 100 cells, that's quite low, and you started therapy, you would lose about 21 years of life compared to somebody who was not HIV infected of the same age. And as your CD4 count was better, it's reduced to 5.4% for years of life. The thing to note is that in that cohort, which is a real-life cohort, 42% of patients started off with a CD4 count of less than 200. That's the late presenters. So we are starting with people presenting late. And that's why they would still be losing about 18 years of life compared to if they were picked up much earlier. That's not very good news. We repeated the, the, the study again just, uh, just recently, and that's, that's, in, that's uh, uh, available online looking at CD4 strata and how long you've been on therapy for and whether or not you are fully suppressed in the open uh, markers uh, versus 
uh, if you are not free suppressed in the closed markers. Take this red line. So these are females, <coughs> age 35, starting with CD4 count of 350 at year at zero, and within a year, their life expectation or expected age of death is about the same of a UK female, which is about 83 now. So with a count of 350, after a year, and the patient maintains suppression, we can say that the longevity is unlikely to be affected. However, on the other hand, you start up with a count of less than 200, you're not suppressed because you've got virus still there, you are having about 23, 25 years loss. That's how bad it is for picking people late, despite all these wonderful drugs we have. We need to get patients early enough. We then looked at, if you start that off with a count of less than 100, how long would it take for you to reach the various CD4 strata? I used 350 because that one, that's the one was the best one. You can see after one year, only 14%, one in six, would be getting there. After three years, only 60% would be getting there. So we are not getting patients tested enough at the right time in order to have the best impact on therapy. And that is a very important message. So the implications that for, for, for that is that we need to have early diagnosis, we need to link them to care, no point in diagnosing them, you have to get them in care, we need to retain them in care, we also need to start therapy and, then allow, and, and also encourage good adherence in order that virus is fully suppressed and doesn't allow for emergence of resistance. And, and we try to be, hopefully not too gung-ho, what we're saying now is that patients who are fully suppressed, properly treated, they should not be uh, excluded from life insurance. Okay? Now, this is a bit about the future. This is using nanocrystals, so not, not of drugs, which have been milled, or the crystal have been milled, and then they put a nano suspension. And then you can give the drugs either once every three months in injection, or once every month. And this is a PK study, and you can see that, that it is doable. And they're probably thinking about using two preparations for treating patients in the near, near future. And the place where it might well be useful as well is taking treatment to prevent infection. There's something called PrEP. So if you are at risk from HIV and your partner doesn't allow you to use protection, you can take something to prevent infection. So that would be quite useful. And no talk about HIV shouldn't be without this slide. Basically, this is Timothy Brown, who had two bone marrow transplant, and the bone marrow was CCR5 delta 32, which means that, and his virus was using the CCR5 receptor, which means that the bone marrow will not be infected by the virus that he has. And he has so had radiotherapy, total body irradiation, and had two bone marrow transplant, and five years down the line, there is no evidence of virus in him at all at present so far. And people are now daring to use the word cure. There are examples like this in the literature. People had therapy in the early stage of HIV, and when they stop therapy, there is no evidence of virus. It's a subgroup, not everyone is doing that. And then there was the Mississippi baby, which was presented last year, a young girl who was diagnosed with HIV within 30 hours of life, given triple therapy, and then she got treatment for 18 months, got lost to follow up, reappeared at age three. There was no evidence of virus in that girl. So the proof is that it can happen. The question is why and how can we replicate this? So what we're doing as part of, again, we're part of this big cohort of, of, of serial converters, looking at, and we're collaborating with the Sanger Institute, looking at exome sequencing to identify some of the genetic traits that contribute to HIV control. Those, you know, what are these people? There are, there are three to five percent of patients who are HIV infected, 
have got antibodies, but no evidence of HIV, no more CD4 cells. What's so special about these people? And that's, that's what we're looking at, and also those rapid progresses. That is work in progress. We've done 50 exomes just now. So in, my, the, in the last few minutes of my talk, I want to talk about hepatitis C, because we're now doing a lot more hepatitis C work. <laughs> this is just to tell us, uh, to remind us about how awful this is. By 2015, we will have 3,000 odd patients who have decompensated liver disease. I don't think that, it, that, that we will have enough transplants for these. We've got to transplant them today now. So there is this is a disease of, of, of urgent need for very effective therapy. If for the HIV positive patients, this is the second leading cause of death. So one of the six deaths would be due to liver disease. Luckily enough, we now have three targets with loads of drugs. We're not talking about few drugs. It's all coming by the bus, bus load. Question is, how do you choose which one to use? <coughs> so we've been involved with, with hep C studies for a long time. This is using pedicet interferon, which can be given once a week. Response rate in HIV was about 30%. And we've done this study recently, and the figure of 74% response rate in HIV co-infected is amazing. And it's no different from HIV, so hep C, <coughs> mono-infected patients. So the result is the same whether you are co-infected. That's using free drugs, using a protease inhibitors, and interferon and ribavirin. Very effective. This is the future. This is just one of the potential drugs we can use. This is uh, in, in brown, from 10 to the power of 6 or, uh, of, of virus, within about less than three and a half weeks, it becomes undetectable. That's using two drugs. If you use three drugs, within two weeks, you could suppress the hepatitis C completely. And we're now talking about using treatment without interferon. Interferon is, is fairly hard to tolerate. Flu-like symptoms and lots of toxicities. Depressed patients can't use it. And we're now talking about treating people eight weeks of all oral therapy. And that is the change coming to the future. So we are hopefully be doing that, this study. Again, this is from, from AbbVie, whereby we'll be using three drugs plus ribavirin, comparing using 12 weeks or 24 weeks. This is co-infected patients. So in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that HIV treatment has been very effective. Over 90% of patients are fully suppressed. We are using personalized medicine because I love, love this slide because we're doing resistance testing at, 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 at start of therapy. We're doing genetic testing for allergic reactions to, to drugs. We're doing viral alert. We're doing drug monitoring, making sure that enough is absorbed. And I think if we diagnose them early enough, a normal lifespan is possible. And we talked about nanotechnology for the future and efforts to find a cure. As far as hep C is concerned, I think it's impressive the results we have. It's a revolution. And it doesn't matter if you've got bad, market, but bad prognostic features, the response rate is the same. And I think the future is going to be interferon free and it will be all after 2016. So I'd like to acknowledge for that all my patients, those who have made it, particularly those who didn't make it because there was no effective drugs at the time. We've been doing those studies for, for the last 25 years. Ray Brettel, uh, who's in the, in the audience, Sheila Morris, who's my nurse coordinator and all the research nurses that we've had, Alan Wilson, who's our data manager, and obviously, you know, Janet Andrews, and his Ray, both doctors in the, in the clinic, who are here today, and been very supportive and helping recruit the patients, and our Hep C and HIV clinical specialists, because I involved them early to translate the clinical trials into, into, into practice, Sheila Burns and, Kate and when she left Kate Templeton, helping us with the logistics because samples of blood are, is flown everywhere around the world, usually Geneva, and there are lots of issues about getting the samples on time. <coughs> Other consultant colleagues in the unit. And these are so the collaborators uh, from Liverpool, uh, Anna Maragherty, Varolgis, Sekou, Pierre Mohamed, UCL, Karan Sebin, Andrew Phillips, and Philip Porter. In Edinburgh, we've mentioned already, 
and that's the 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 uh, the work the Welcome Sanger uh, Institute uh, here. Over and in terms of funders, NHS Leiden, who's paid my salary, uh, we've had <laughs> we've had uh, funding from NIH, MRC, chief scientists, and then from from the EU, and then all the drug companies who uh, have chosen us as a site in order to test the, the, the products for them. And they've been very useful in terms of saving lives because patients had to wait otherwise for the drugs to be available in the clinic. So they had access to them very early. Thank you very much. I'm sure you'll all uh, agree with me that it was, it was worth the wait. Um, and, I mean, we've seen a real tour de force this evening, uh, learning about the emergence of a new disease, how it was first diagnosed, the application of that diagnosis, the delivery of new treatments, the revolution in healthcare that's been driven by clinicians such as uh, Clifford and the drug companies that have developed these new, very exciting antivirals. And I've, and I've turned something which, is, as you put, has started off life, as it were, as a death sentence to something that's treatable and now compatible with uh, a, a, a normal life expectancy. And I think one of the most important things that's come through um, in, in this afternoon or this evening's talk is that in the best traditions of the clinician investigator at all times, that the application of that science has been informed by compassion and by careful attention to the needs of the patients uh, in, in what was a very special and difficult time. So... Would you all join with me in thanking Clifford once more for a superb inaugural lecture? This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.